to meet you. Uh, Matt is part of the team of Hourglass Brewery, uh, part of the management team. And I have uh, just a few simple questions for Matt. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask you how how the magic happens. You know, if you when you create a beer, just from the first step when you have to think about it, like what kind of ingredients, uh, what kind of taste you want to, what 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 is the goal you want to achieve while creating a beer. Can you get us through all the steps you have to do to go? Absolutely. Um, I would say each brewer has their own way of, of coming at this problem. Um, people are approaching it from all different angles. Um, personally speaking, I have a culinary background, um, a cooking background, so I approach things that way. I've always been interested in coming up with new and different flavor combinations, things that might not hit people right at first. Um, and so I try to bring that to my brewing. Um, and, but one thing I think that it comes through Hourglass altogether is um, trying to do something unique, something a little bit different. Um, trying to bring things that maybe we haven't seen before. Um, so really, it's, it's all about trying to find unique and different ingredients and then bringing it together into a beer that still makes sense when you drink it. Um, for example, we have several beers on right now that are very different to the average beer drinker. We have our put the lime and the coconut, which is a sour, low alcohol beer style. It was our favorite. You know, and <laughs> the best thing is like my wife loves this beer, and I, I like it. And Lance told me the best of the women. It's it's really popular, but it also catches a lot of people off guard. Um, a Berliner Weiss, which is the base style for the beer, has a very long history. A German beer, um, which is interesting because Germany is very rooted in tradition, um, and so. But now in America, people have been adding different fruit, fruit flavors to it, um, and Sky had the idea of almost like a key lime pie type thing. With that that play between lime and coconut, um, it plays very well with that style. So that's kind of what I'm roundabout kind of what I'm getting to is kind of think about these flavor ideas and then go back to the beer figure out how can we incorporate these best, which style will go best with it, how is it still going to be palatable, and how is it still going to come across well to the average consumer. But when you've got this idea, and uh, I know that Sky and Brad, they, I wish we could met them up there up here today, yeah. but they started as a home brewers. Absolutely. So if you want to brew beer at home, what do you do? Um, there are several different ways to approach it. You can do things, if you're using things like malt extract, um, all you, need, you need very little equipment. You need basically a, a container um, to ferment it, which is often called a carboy. People use plastic buckets as well. Um, you just need one of those in a pot. And essentially that's, other than a few tools like a siphon to get things from the oven into the fermenter, that's all you need. Um, you can do things very cheaply, or you can go much bigger and more elaborate, spend a few hundred dollars um, and get a mash ton and actually buy the grain yourself and do exactly what we do here on a much smaller level. Um, and that's actually how I got my start, is I started on my stove top in my kitchen in, a, in an apartment, um, got some extract and some hot pellets and made a beer and I fell in love with it. I, it was um, immediately, I tasted it. I enjoyed it, thought I could do better. <laughs> you still want to brew uh, beer at home? Absolutely, yeah. I, um, I just bottled up a beer at home um, a, a few weeks ago. It's just getting ready to drink. Um, probably in just a, a few short days, it'll be, <laughs> it'll be ready to start popping open test bottles. Um, yeah, it's, it's something that, even brewing here, you can do things at home. Uh, it's on a much smaller scale, so you can do things by ingredients that you might not might not make sense for a brewery. Yeah, and you um, can adjust some things, you know, just for your taste. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I brew beer specifically at home for me. <laughs> I think what's something that I want to try um, that isn't out there that I can't just buy yet. Um, and then I cut right by ingredient and write down my recipe, get the ingredients, and I brew it right then. Matt, you know, uh, there are certain brands of beer they're selling very good because of marketing and advertising and people just get used to what they, what they like and sometimes they, they don't even want to try anything different and uh, 
average, we know what average American consumer drinks and in Europe it's like, wherever you go, it's in France, Germany um, and Poland, there's some brand that people just tend to buy very often. And obviously in Czech and in Poland, Germany and Belgium, the culture of drinking beer is, is different, but in USA we know that average customer buys like about five years later, exactly. they are eighty percent of the market. Right. So um, you work here, and I know that sometimes you're behind the bar, so you have this, uh, you have this, you you, you see customers, you, you talk to them, you have interaction with them. So can you tell me how is it changed in the United States and people's minds, like they, they, their approach to beer, the culture of beer? Because me myself, I know people who treat beer as a wine. They used to love wine, they used to go to California, France, you know, to uh, Bordeaux and, 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 you know, uh, just to discover wine, and now they're into beer. And how, how has it changed? Please tell me a little bit. Yeah, I mean, 20 to 30 years ago, everybody, the only American beer that you could find was what they call an adjunct lager. They're very light in flavor, um, light in color, and there's not much crap behind it. It's um, they're very simple and easy to drink. It was essentially a way to get alcohol into somebody <laughs> um, as easily and inoffensively as possible. Just the simplest drinking stuff you could find. Um, over time, companies like Sam Adams, Sierra Nevada, some of these craft beer companies that have now been around for 20 years have really opened up the public side. They want, and people are realizing that beer can be more than just that. Um, People used to say, one of my favorite things is when somebody will come in with a group of friends and the friends all drink beer and they'll say, I don't like beer. And I consider that almost a challenge um, because there are so many flavors in beer that I feel like it's impossible to not like beer. If you don't, I don't think that you can dislike every beer. You, we, again, the lime and the coconut is light, sour, um, citrusy, very bright, and then you have things that taste um, from companies like Funky Buddha that they make a blueberry cobbler beer that tastes like blueberry cobbler. I was uh, I was actually um, for a lot of day and I, I tested some of the beers. So, so yeah, it's it's great. You come in and and like I said, it's fun to bartend now in in a place like this with so many beers that we make that are interesting and so many also offering other guest taps that are interesting. Because people come in, I just I must consider it a challenge because. People, people do, now they recognize that there are these different flavors, but they might not know where to go, so you can help guide them. Or do you like bitter things, and maybe you like an IPA, do you like sweet things, maybe you I like, like dessert stuff. tell you that they like cocktails, like, I like pina colada, I like margarita. If you mix this jalapeno beer and uh, key lime, I mean a cocoa, a lime, a lime and a cocoa, it tastes like margarita. Exactly. This is amazing, you know, it's amazing. And you can also reach different cultures that way. Um, like that, the sabor de manito is more of like a, a Latin American flavor. Um, and the lime coconut is almost like a tropical flavor. But if you mix the two of them, you have pepper, lime, and coconut, which is almost like a Thai dish. Um, you often get those ingredients in Thai food. Um, so with different flavor combinations, you can really speak to different, what people are used to. You can come up with flavors that um, are more ingrained into their culture, more flavors that they're used to, and that's a way to start opening up people's eyes and get them to try new things. How often does it happen that you have a customer who came here just by coincidence and because friends back to me and like, ah, you know, I'm used to the, drinking this American Pilsner and Lager beer and I, I like to uh, drink. Uh, how often uh, do you see that those people drink from and they're like, wow. I'd say it, it happens more often than not. More people that come in, if, if they're willing to try things, then more, most of the time they leave having found something they like better than the American adjunct boxes. They find something, you know, it might take four or five different styles that they try, not quite this one, not quite that one, and then all of a sudden get one, their eyes kind of light up, they get a smile on their face, this is really good. Um, and then it's, it's not un uncommon at all to see those same people come in a few days later. What else do you have that tastes like that one? <laughs> is it more healthy to do that from that point on? Is it more healthy and is it better for your body actually to drink crop beers than, than just um, regular beers? 
it can go either way. Um, there are some craft beers that are absolutely loaded with sugar, um, and so those aren't necessarily going to be more healthy for you. Um, but then there are others that have um, live yeast and bacteria in them, which doesn't sound like the healthiest thing, but there it actually can very much help with um, with gut bacteria. It can help with digestion, um, and it can it can definitely be a better alternative than just the like the regular American beers that aren't. They're not going to do anything positive. It might not be the worst thing in the world for you beer-wise, but it, it's almost, they're kind of in the middle, I'd say. You can, there are some pretty unhealthy craft American beers, for sure. I mean, it, some of these dessert stouts just have a ton of sugar in them. It's closer to like a soda bottle. So, um, but if you do something, which is like a style that's popular in Belgium, um, a Saison, they have, they often have live wild yeast in them, which is good for um, your gut. And then they also are very dry, so they have very little sugar left in them. So comparatively speaking, they're much better. And my last question is about basically about the future, you know. How do you see a future, uh, especially like here in the United States, because right now we know that microbreweries and family owners like Hourglass are booming. Yeah. You have, especially like I see in, in Tampa Bay, you have brewer breweries everywhere, new breweries all the time, they, they just pop up like from nowhere. Absolutely. And how do you see the future? Because uh, do, you, do you think that breweries will stay small and family all? And, and I think you're going to run a wide range. Um, I think right now we're seeing like it's almost an like explosive growth. There's more breweries every day. Um, and in the, for the last few years, it's literally, if you, if you look at the entire country, there's more than one brewery opening every day. Um, and while that's wonderful, you can't support that kind of growth forever. Um, so what I think will end up happening is people will continue to buy more craft beer, but the rates at which that, that market grows will slow down. And you'll find the, some of these smaller breweries that aren't making as good of a product, they'll start, it'll start weeding them out, they'll go out of business. Because just because a brewery is small, um, and technically a microbrewery or a nanobrewery doesn't always mean that they have a great product. Um, you always want to support your local breweries, um, but over time you'll find out that the ones who are making good beer are, are going to stay, and the ones that aren't making quite as good beer will, will start having trouble as the market starts falling off a little bit. But I don't, I don't see it being a huge boom and then crash. I kind of see it being a rise and then it'll kind of taper off to where it stays at this level. Yeah, I have mixed feelings myself because I see this place and I, I spoke with Lance, with, with Shane, I work on, 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 on different view and I see that there is a passion here. It's not just about, it's not even about money, it's about passion to beer. Absolutely. And uh, on one hand, I wish you guys all the best and all the money in the world. But on the other hand, I would like you guys to stay local, stay small, you know, so, so you still are this exactly. family-owned place and this, this, you have this feel, feeling, you know, you can personal. Yeah. Personally, I think that there is room for both. You see some craft breweries, um, again, like some, somebody like Sierra Nevada or Samuel Adams, which, is now, which are now huge companies. Um, they employ thousands and thousands of people, and that's wonderful. They're getting very good beer to a lot of people for an affordable price. Um, but I think places like this will continue to stick around. Also, if you look at Europe as a good example, a lot of towns have these little breweries all throughout Europe that you might not have heard of even if you live 100 miles away, but they've been there for hundreds of years and the community supports them. We're lucky here where the community has been absolutely incredible to us. Um, we, if it weren't for, for the Longwood community specifically and the, the surrounding areas, there's no way we could have expanded the way we have. Um, but it, in, you know, I think that that's not going to go away. Um, there's always there's going to be people breweries that continue to get bigger and bigger, um, but you're also going to find breweries that stay in that nice small size, um, doing exactly what they want to do, without having to worry about corporate entities telling them they have to do this or they have to do that. Um, Those are more uh, corporate. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, it, again, it's a shame that you didn't get to talk to Sky. Um, because I, and Sky and Brett and Lance, um, I mean, you did get to talk to Lance a little bit, but I think that that type of direction is something that none of them want. They don't, 
like you said, it's nice to be successful, but they don't want to give up the reins to everything that they've created. They don't want to just make something and then sell it off to the highest bidder. They're very passionate. This is our class, it's their place. And I believe that they continue, that they're going to continue to keep maintaining. It's a Saison, um, which is a Belgian French style ale. Um, usually a product of open fermentation. You'll notice a little bit of funkiness on that one. Um, good for those who like light beers but want a little something. Alright, moving on to the dark ones. This is the uh, Barista's Blessing. Barista's Blessing? Yes, this is. I like, uh, I like the names of the beers. <laughs> That's all credit to uh, Sky Connolly and uh, Mike and Matt back of house, um, they, uh, they get together and brainstorm a lot of fun, funky names. Yeah, because they not only create a good beer, but they, also they create a nice personality. Yeah, they're they're sure. they're, yeah. So this sure is um, the base recipe for our brown ale. We've added Madagascar vanilla bean um, and fresh espresso from local roasters. We're actually doing a barista series right now. I love this one. This is fantastic. It tastes a little bit of that dark coffee. Um, and it is on nitro, so if you've ever had a Guinness, it's going to have the same mouthfeel. Very smooth. That's much better. Oh, oh, sure. Totally different styles, but if you've ever had the creaminess of a Guinness. I, I tried some coffee beers. I okay. don't know about this one. It's like, I would like to drink that one. Oh, um, this one. But I can. Uh, sometimes I do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next we have our brown ale. Um, this is the base recipe for the uh, Barista's Blessing. Um, traditional brown ale, this is one of our staples. We try and keep this on as often as we can. You'll find a little bit of creaminess, a little bit of nuttiness to it. Um, fantastic beer. Wonderful beer, one of my favorites. Right, next up is the 31 Rupees. This is the heavy hitter. This is uh, an English style barley wine. Um, Barley wines are beers that are typically this higher in alcohol. Yes, you, you noticed it. 10%. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's a nice one. Yeah. Um, a little bit of hoppiness on the back end, but otherwise an English style barley wine. Very, typically very elevated in alcohol. Maybe you can explain why does it have a, if you, if you buy a beer, mm -hmm. just regular beer, you know, and uh, it has 10%, you can mm -hmm. feel the spirit of it. Yeah, you feel, you feel like if you're drinking vodka. Mm -hmm. Yeah, almost but, the heat on the back. Yeah, yeah. but with, with this one, I can feel it's strong, but you don't feel it's so smooth. The, the we use um, extra malts, extra of the grain that kind of gives it a little bit of sweetness. Um, I genuinely think this is one of our most well balanced beers. It hides the ten percent very well. Um, so typically, if it's going to be high in alcohol, overcompensate a little bit with the malts, make it nice and sweet. That might be tricky, you know, because you you'll have two. Oh okay. yeah, it like will that. it will definitely sneak up on you. We have to make then, sure that, uh, nobody's having too many of those or throwing them back too fast. And then you better call Uber. Oh yeah. By the way, so you guys still have Uber in Orlando? Or? Oh yeah, we do. Yeah, they fought hard to uh, try and kick Uber out, but yeah, we were so fighting hard on that. Though, so yeah. But uh, yeah, they're wonderful. Uh, I will get some water. All right. Get a chip and maybe in the meantime you can explain and. Tell us something more about those guys who actually are behind. Uh, sure. Ruling. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned the Sky. And Sky Connolly is uh, one of the three owners. Um, he's kind of uh, heading up everything in back of the house, uh, supervises everything. And we have uh, Mike DeLancet and Matt Dremel, uh, two fantastic brewers. Uh, very experimental by nature. They make some fantastic beers. And uh, we're really proud to have them in the back making us some beers, all three of those guys. It makes my job a little bit easier when, uh, when we have some great beers to sell. So they created all of those, every single one of them. Most of the recipes are Sky's original recipes, um, either from the old location or they are, um, some of them are a little bit newer by nature. All right, let's move on. on. to the next, we are at the Le Soir. Le Soir means the night. Uh, this is a Belgian IPA. So again, uh, similar to the same uh, nice the night. Uh, oh goodness, uh, Dutch. Dutch? Because in French, it's la, la nuit. La nuit. Yeah. 
Oh, I like I like those names. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it gives it gives yeah, all the yeah, a little more character. Especially you know, for me uh, being European, it's like wow. Yeah. What's it was the name? Le Les Soir. Les Soir. Les Soir. So this is a uh, Belgian IPA. Again, similar to the Zan local Zan Loper. You'll notice the Belgian yeast character up front with a little more pronounced bitterness. Mm -hmm. 